come to tell you that the only thing standing between us and our liberation is organization. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you have a responsibility. The only way you can help your people is by helping to organize them. And the only way you can do that is by joining an organization. Join the NAACP, join the Urban League, join the Nation of Islam, join PUSH, join the All-African People's Revolutionary Party. Join an organization if you love your people. Thank you. Ready for the revolution. Kwame Torre, let's hear it. People of the world, victory is ours today if we recognize how much of nothing we are and how great Almighty God Allah is. I want white America to know that I can truthfully speak for my people, the red nations of this Western Hemisphere. The black and the red are joining in unity. And this is the power, the spiritual power that they are afraid of. The woman must play an important part in the development of the nation or the nation will go to hell. What do we want in Palestine? We want nothing short, nothing short of total liberation of the land of Palestine because it is our rights, it is our ancestral patrimony and the people of Palestine, the people of Palestine promise you that they will continue to struggle by all means available at their disposal, by armed struggle above all until all of Palestine is liberated and assalamu alaikum and may God bless you and please continue to aid the nation of Islam, long live Palestine, long live Africa, long live the struggle of the people of the world. When you see your black brothers in South Africa rising up with nothing in their hands, challenging a powerful government that has oppressed them, you are witnessing the resurrection of the dead. If we, you and I, are going to have some power, then we have to get together economically, and you can no longer look on us as primitives, because we got the land and we got the power, the energy power. When the leader sells out the people, he should pay a price for that. Don't you think so? Do you think the leader should sell you out and then live? We should make examples of the leaders so that the next one that comes along will respect you enough to do that which pleases the masses of the people. Brother, we thank you for the opportunity to demonstrate our solidarity with a black man who is willing to stand up. We want anybody who's listening to understand that we recognize that this is our brother. This is our brother. This is our brother. If you harm this brother, you spent nine billion dollars last year on alcohol, four billion on tobacco, and nearly fifteen billion on illicit drugs. Nearly thirty billion dollars poor people threw away on foolishness. Don't you think we ought to be a little more wise with the money we have and use it to build black people up? To the black leadership, 
to the black scholars and to the black educators. Stop being afraid to stand up on the side of truth and justice. continue to sell our people, our black women, and our children into slavery. If Delilah has blinded you, pray for strength so that he may lead you to the pillars of America's temples and institutions of ball and hypocrisy and false religious practices and help to bring her to her well-deserved end for all the blood that has been shed of our innocent black people in America. It is a shame that we would here have to defy and to be told that we are an enemy to God when they have practiced white supremacy for 430 years butchering our people. So I close by saying, woe to America, shadowed with wings. Your end has come. Do not lift your hand against our precious brother, Minister Farrakhan. Do not lift your hand and your voice any longer, because Allah will certainly bring retribution and destruction upon this land. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Tanetta Muhammad. And if you are chosen to do a job that you will stand up for God and do your duty by all of humanity and treat every human being the way you would like to be treated. I am not a racist. I will treat a white man like I want to be treated and I will honor him and respect him if he's worthy of honor and if he submits to the will of God. He is my brother even though he is white. He is my brother in the faith. This building, Madison Square Garden, is already etched on the pages of history. But never has it been so deeply engraved as it is about to be in a few minutes. There was a time when when you said Madison Square Garden to a black person in America, the image of one man stood out. It wasn't the image of hockey players, of basketball players, of track stars, but there was one man whose name and face stood out to black America because he was not only the heavyweight champion in boxing, he was our champion. When Joe Lewis won a fight, every black person shared in the victory. And the most articulate sound that black people could hear had nothing to do with Shakespeare. It had nothing to do with Emerson. It didn't even have anything to do with Langston Hughes, but it was when a black man stood in Madison Square Garden and said, just another, light, another lucky night, I'm glad I win. The school teachers may have thought that he was talking wrong, but to all of us, he was talking right. And we grew up in a day when nothing else seemed good to us when the depression was on, unemployment was high, we were just desolate and the one bright spark was our champion, Joe Lewis. Tonight, we have a greater champion coming before us right here. And it's nothing more than fitting that he should come to us in Madison Square Garden. This man, Minister Louis Farrakhan, is not known for his physical prowess, although he's not too light at that either. Minister Farrakhan is known for his combating something greater than mere flesh. He combats that which controls the flesh. Minister Farrakhan has not played the bum of the month thing that Joe Lewis and Muhammad Ali finally had to do. You see, they ran out of great competitors and they started having to deal with lesser and lesser fighters. It's been the opposite with Minister Farrakhan. The longer he toils, the greater enemy he comes up against. And the greater enemy he comes up against, the harder he fights and the better the knockout.
Today, he faces the greatest challenger that has ever come up against our champion. This is a challenger who knocked Henry Ford out of the ring. I know all of you are familiar with that. I know all of you, you know that this man, Henry Ford, who was a giant in industry, had the nerve to write a series of columns that was turned into volumes of books called The International Jew, and that he was forced to apologize and pay them for even saying so. So this is a challenger that has knocked this great man out of the ring. But here comes a black man. A black man who stands up today and challenges. <laughs> Here's our champion. Here's our champion, Farrakhan. The world champion. The heavyweight champion. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. I greet you, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace Assalam alaikum. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, words are not adequate to express the joy that I feel in coming home to New York City, the place of my birth. and to see the people whom I love jammed into Madison Square Garden, filling the felt forum, they're next door watching on closed circuit television, and they're all out around the garden tonight in spite of Mayor Koch. Beloved brother.
brothers and sisters, I want you to settle down. We have a lot to say in a short time in which to say it. I beg your pardon for our being late, but it just was so many people. Thank you for your patience, brothers and sisters. Thank you. I must first thank all of those who helped to make this night possible. Naturally, all of you and the hard work of Brother Abdul Allah and the believers here of Temple Number no. 7, New York City, and those from the East Coast who worked right along with him, and of course from Chicago, who helped make this night possible. Thank you all for your hard work, for your words, for your encouragement. Thank you. But most important of all, thanks belongs to Almighty God, Allah, for He and He alone is giving us victory over our enemies. Our enemies did everything possible to keep you from me. They couldn't keep me from you. And I must say to you that I'm honored tonight beyond words to see my many Muslim brothers and sisters from every persuasion of Islam and my many Christian brothers and sisters from the various denominations of Christianity. So we have Christians and Muslims, nationalists, Pan-Africanists, Socialists, Communists, all under one mighty roof. <laughs> Eighty-two days before the death of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in his farewell pilgrimage, Allah revealed to Prophet Muhammad the 110th Surah of the Holy Quran and verse 5, verse 3, pardon me, in the fifth chapter of the Quran, both of these two sections of the Quran form the basis of my talk to you tonight. The 110th Surah has two ones and a zero. It's very significant. Listen to the words. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah the Beneficent, the Merciful, when Allah's help and victory comes, and thou seest men entering the religion of Allah in companies, celebrate the praise of thy Lord and ask his protection. Surely he is ever returning to mercy. I bear witness that I am of myself nothing. I bear witness that I can of myself do nothing. But if I have the powerful one and his mighty servant backing nothing, then I have the help that I need to become victorious over my enemies and you have the help that you need 
to become victorious over yours, black brother and sister, Puerto Rican brother and sister, Chicano brother and sister, Native American brother and sister, Arab brother and sister, oppressed people of the world. Victory is ours today if we recognize how much of nothing we are and how great Almighty God Allah is. This day, Prophet Muhammad said, peace be upon him, have I perfected for you your religion and completed my favor to you and chosen for you Islam as a religion. Allah says to Prophet Muhammad, this day I have completed my favor. This book, Quran, is the favor of God to all human beings of every color, every race, every nationality. This book is God's favor. He completed it with Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he perfected it. He perfected not only the, the religion, but through this Quran, it lays down a perfect guide for the perfection of man. I have completed my favor on you, and I have chosen for you Islam as a religion. I have chosen, this is God talking. He not talking that he have chosen for you some other faith. He has chosen for you submission to the will of God as the only path to his divine favor. Well, you may say, I am a Christian. And you may say, I am a Jew. This is what you call yourself. Please, beloved, listen. Allah never sent Jesus to teach Christianity. Listen, Christians. Listen. Listen, preachers. Don't get angry. Listen. Jesus did not teach what you call Christianity. He knew nothing of it. That is a name that was given to the followers of Jesus and it's written there in the book that at Antioch they became known as Christians. But what did Jesus call himself and what did he call those who followed him? Listen, my Jewish friends. God never named a religion Judaism. He gave Moses the Torah, not Judaism. That is the name that you put on the word of Almighty God. You put Judaism on it. You put Christianity on it. But Jesus and Moses both taught us to bow down, not to statues, not to stone, not to images, but to bow down to one God and one God alone. Allahu Akbar. The beloved Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. How do you say that in Arabic? When a man says, not my will, but God's will be done, you say it Islam or you say Muslim. So when we say to you, Islam, we're not bringing a strange religion. We're bringing that which all the prophets taught. I heard Rabbi Tannenbaum as I was slipping into New York last night <laughs> saying that Judaism is the mother of Islam. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. 
The Torah predated the revelation of the Quran. But if the Torah had not been corrupted, then we would not have had to reveal the Quran, for you had the book. <laughs> Prophet Muhammad gave these words to his beloved followers on Arafat in Saudi Arabia 1,406 years ago, or near 1,400 years ago. 82 days later, the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, was no longer among us, but he said to his followers, I leave with you two things. This Quran and my example. If you follow this Quran and you follow my example, you will be on the straight path and you will not deviate from that path. This day, here in Madison Square Garden in New York City, I'm delivering my final speech for a long time. Wait. You may ask, why, Brother Farrakhan? Have they frightened you? Not hardly. For eight years, I have crossed the United States doing from 250,000 to 350,000 miles of travel each year making speeches. This kind of traveling and speaking has done exactly what Allah intended for it to do. It has created, once again, movement in the masses of the people toward the truth. And it is. And it is this movement that the presence and the power of truth is creating in the hearts of the people that is responsible for your being here tonight to see and to hear what we have to say. This speech tonight ends phase one of the rebuilding effort of the work of the Nation of Islam. Phase one. I have been blessed to see the universality of the message of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and that that message is applicable to every human being on the earth. Consequently, the time limiting this message, particularly to black people in America and America in general, is now accomplished. And now this message and its universal application must reach more deeply the Puerto Ricans, the Chicanos, the Indians, in short, the totality of the human family of our planet. So, for the remaining months of this year, I shall be going to the Caribbean, to Africa, to the Isles of the Pacific, to the Far East and Asia, to impart what Almighty God has blessed us with of the knowledge of Islam and the knowledge of this book, Quran. You say, but Farrakhan, you are just a baby in Islam. What can you tell the Muslim world since they have had the religion 1400 years before you were born? Yes, you have had it a long time, all right. But don't be surprised if one speaks to you out of the cradle and rocks the world from the cradle. And if a baby rocks the world from the cradle, then what will the baby do when it grows up?
If it be the will of Allah, when I return from the Caribbean, Central, South America, Africa, and the Far East, we will settle down to take the word of God and make it flesh. Speaking is wonderful. But now the time for speaking is over. The time of hard work to build an Islamic community, an Islamic state, an Islamic nation for black people has begun. We must now go to work and make flesh real, make the word real. From the mature understanding that Allah is giving to us of the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I have asked all of you to come here tonight from different walks of life, from different races or nations, on this, the seventh day of October, which is the birthday of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I would like to say before I go any further that from now on every year in October around the seventh of the month we will celebrate what we call Savior's Day because what is you what are you doing Farrakhan The more you know about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the more you will understand that his word actually came to save us from the condition that America had put us in. And so to honor that work, we honor him and his work, but we praise Allah over and over again for a man that did so much for us, but too few of us really understood him. So tonight, I am exceedingly happy to be here in this international city, in this prestigious auditorium, Madison Square Garden, a place that has been given to song and dance, sport and play, but tonight, we see this auditorium filled to capacity with people who hunger for truth and thirst for liberation. Now if you notice, I have around me tonight sisters. I want to send a message to the entire world that the world is in the condition that is in because the world disrespects women. The world is headed into hell because the world disrespects womanhood. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the major contributor to the freeing of women. Unfortunately, traditions that are foreign to Islam have crept into Islam to push the woman out of that which Almighty God intends for her. The oppression of women in the world is a manifestation of the weakness of the societies of the earth. Listen, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that Allah is self-created. The Quran says, he begets not, nor was he begotten. Well, if he was not begotten, he's self-created. And if he's self-created and created himself out of the black womb of the darkness of space, think about this now. He has 
with so much respect for that womb, he kept going back into it, creating sun and moon and stars and planets. Whenever a people disrespect the womb, they cut off their creative powers. When you disrespect woman, you disrespect that which absolutely shows you a part of the nature of God himself. This is why the oft-repeated words of the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You have a Rahman and you have a Rahim. You have the pot coming out of the nature of God. Out of the love of the Creator. He creates and does good for all his creatures. Then there's another part out of his love called Rahim or mercy, undeserved kindness, where he gives to you and you don't deserve anything. A mother will love her child when it is wrong. She will love it and be kind to it when it doesn't deserve it. This is part of her nature. When man denies woman, he denies a part of his own nature that gives him balance. This is why the world is messed up today. You have denied woman and you have denied the quality of mercy in your own self. So I have sisters around me to say to the whole world, the woman must play an important part in the development of the nation or the nation will go to hell. The woman must not be looked at, brothers, as an object of pleasure and something to bear babies with no intelligence. Any nation that has an uncultivated woman becomes an uncultivated nation. It is a foolish man who denies the mosque to the woman. The woman should be in the mosque because when she knows the Quran, studies the Quran, takes the Quran and internalizes it, she takes your children and she nurtures them in the Quran. But when you push her out and make her to feel like she's not wanted, she's not as good as the man then there's a dislike in her and she passes it on to the children and so the children go away from Allah rather than coming toward Allah. You mistreat your woman, you mistreat yourself. You push your woman down, you push yourself down. You pick your woman up, you and I go up. Are you speaking about black women? I'm speaking about all women, no matter what their color is. And let me say this, those who condemn me, who call me a bigot, who call me a racist, who call me a hater, who call me an anti-Semite, I want you to listen to me real carefully tonight. And if anything like that comes out of my mouth, raise your hand and stop me here. But you'll only be raising your hand no matter what your color is and cheering me on because that is what they say I am. But tonight you judge for yourself and members of the press. <laughs> members of the press. I want you to know it is a great honor to me to see you in so much numbers here tonight. It is an honor. 
But dear members of the press, I want you to listen carefully to me so you get my words right tonight for once. That's for once. Now, I seem to have become quite a controversial fellow. <laughs> See, everywhere Farrakhan goes, there's controversy around this man. There has not been a black man in the history of America that has been so repudiated <laughs> as Brother Farrakhan. I thought they did a bad job on my teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I thought they did a bad job on Mr. Garvey. I thought they did a bad job on Kwame Touré and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. I thought they did a bad job on those brothers. But the stuff that they do to me so continuously. You might wonder tonight why Brother Farrakhan is smiling. I know something. I know something. Can you imagine? The governor of this state, Mr. Cuomo. The mayor of this city, Mr. Koch. Senators and congressmen and assemblymen. Yeah, I don't blame you, brothers and sisters. They need it. some poor pitiful black leaders have spoken out they have condemned me without a fair hearing I know that Mr. Dinkins has not heard one of my tapes and most of these people that I've I've talked with them on a personal one-on-one -on -one basis. They act as though they don't know me. Farrakhan is not a stranger. You know I'm not that kind of person. Why didn't you stand up and tell them? I'll tell you why in a minute. The mayor, the governor, the president, the vice president, the senate, they've called me a lot of ugly names. Now, if I were a man of weaker character, these kinds of ugly names would make me feel so badly that I would not be able to appear in the public. However, it is because I know the rightness of the truth that I speak and the rightness of the cause for which I am raised up by Allah that these words only serve as fuel for the fire in me to make me fight harder with the truth that I have received from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Look at some of the names that they call me. I've been called divisive, a Hitler lover. They even went so far as to call me in the Jewish paper this week, the new Hitler. A hater, a clan lover, a con man, a bigot. And then they topped it all off. They called me the devil himself. Mr. Koch, Mr. Koch said, I should burn in hell. <laughs> Say, dear Mr. Koch, black people in New York City live in hell.
people in New York City live in hell and you are the keeper of hell, then you must be the real devil himself. too much time on Mr. Koch. But Mr. Koch ought to be very careful. He really should be very careful. Because he don't have any power to assign me to hell. None whatsoever. But be careful, Mr. Koch. Because the scripture says that on Jesus' return, he will not accept certain characteristics. of their using these kind of words. What is the purpose of such words being written by the press and spoken in the public by men and women of renown? The aim is to discredit a man by the use of false terms without any just basis. The aim is to create an environment of hostility around that man that will keep the people from hearing what he has to say. If I'm a hater, who wants to be involved in hate? If I'm a bigot, who wants to be involved in bigotry? If I'm an anti-Semite, see they're trying to discredit the power of my message by calling me names that will undercut my magnetic attraction in my own people. See? Evidently it's not working. Look, calling me those names is designed to undercut any support that you might want to give me. It is to alienate people from me who might desire to help me then it is designed to isolate me and then of course destroy my influence among black people and then ultimately the aim is to murder me. That's the ultimate aim. Now I want you all to reason with me. You won't hear me tonight call for killing anybody. But look, the idea of my being referred to as a Hitler is to plant in the minds of those who suffered from Hitler's mind and Hitler's work that we must never allow Hitler to come up again so we must never allow this man Farrakhan to grow into power that he may do to us what Hitler did to us. Isn't that something? So, brothers and sisters, the germ of murder is already sown in the heart of Jews across this nation and across the world. And those who sympathize with Jews, they have a heart now filled with murder for Louis Farrakhan. So some person is going to think, as the scripture says, that they're doing God a favor and seek my death. Isn't that something? When I spoke in the forum in Los Angeles, 19,000 black people came out. The Jewish Defense League was outside chanting to kill Farrakhan. Kill Farrakhan. Yesterday on the news, we saw them asking the question, what do you want? 
We want Farrakhan. How do you want him? We want him dead. Now, you can't find one word in the text of my speeches that calls for death to Jews. But I am made to look like a total wicked man and here are people calling for my death. Let me say to you, Mr. Press and Mr. Government of America, what do you think will happen to America if anything happens to me? of my people in America and oppressed people all over the world so death don't phase me but I wonder are you as ready to die as you are to kill I want you to think tonight don't worry about work tomorrow because you'll fly to work tomorrow if you got a job Just make believe this is Saturday night and we're partying tonight. Brothers and sisters, isn't it interesting that people are not neutral where Louis Farrakhan is concerned? They either love me or they hate me. There doesn't seem to be any middle ground. Many of them make Farrakhan the litmus test that determines jobs and position. If you condemn Farrakhan, you can get the job. If you don't condemn Farrakhan, you will lose the job. Black people in Hollywood showed up at a $50 plate dinner and the TV scanned to see who was there and the next day, some of those black actors were being threatened just for being in attendance. They didn't say anything. But I want you to know, you just can't frighten black people anymore like you used to. That is over with. Look. Now I want you to think with me, brothers and sisters, please. There are those who call me devil. And evidently, by the sound in this auditorium, you believe that Farrakhan is a good man. Now wait, wait a minute. How could there be such opposing views of one individual that range from the extreme of God to the extreme of devil. How could one man evoke that kind of hatred on one side and love on the other? What is the nature and character of a man that can inspire two extremes at the same time? And what does this have to do with the time in which we live and what we should expect from God in such time? Don't you realize that the people are divided over me? And this is exactly the way it is written. The book says that this day would be great. There's that word again. Great and dreadful. The day has two dispositions that are opposite each other. Then the man of God who comes in this time will manifest those two dispositions in the people. He will manifest love and he will manifest hate. You say he's divisive. It has to be that way. 
You can't mix God and Satan. You can't mix a hypocrite with a true believer. You can't mix a slave master with a slave. An oppressor with the oppressed. Something has to separate them and make them see each other. And then we go to war to find out who is going to rule on this earth. Either God or Satan, right or wrong. This is not a play day. This is the day of war. It is not I who have said it. The scripture has said it. It is the time of war. You are not going to get liberation praying about it. You got to pray about it, then we got to get up and do something about it. You see what your family is doing in South Africa, don't you? Now, is this man Farrakhan from God or is he from Satan? Now look, if I were from Satan, this world would love me because this is Satan's work. <laughs> then, if I am from God and God is against this world, then this world will be against me. But then what will God do when you come against me? You got to think today, white folks. This is serious. Look. Who are the people that are angry with Farrakhan? Who are they? Are the people that are angry with me the righteous? Would you say that the Jews who are angry with me are righteous people? They're not? I didn't hear you. That's what I thought you said. States government, it censured me. Is this a righteous government? No. Would you say that the mayor is a righteous and just mayor? No. If Jesus or God were to judge the governor, would Governor Como come out on God's side? No. Well, who are these people that condemn me? and their character and out of what spirit do they condemn me and who are these that support me who are they look what is the nature and the quality of you who stood outside crushed in lines to come here tonight to see your brother you are the ones that have been deprived of justice by the rich of this nation. You represent the oppressed. And if God sends a deliverer to the oppressed, will the oppressor love him? They have compared me with the most evil of their people. Why did not they compare me with some of the better men of history? Or why did not you compare me with the best of men, particularly the man that is reputed in both the Bible and the Quran to be one of the most virtuous men that ever lived, and that is Jesus. Why did not you say, press, he reminds us of Jesus? wait a minute that's not blasphemy Jesus had a controversy with the Jews Farrakhan
Farrakhan has a controversy with the Jews. Listen, just listen. Jesus was hated by the Jews. Farrakhan is hated by the Jews. Jesus was scourged in the synagogues and in the temples. And Farrakhan's name was ringing in the synagogues and temples of this nation as a wicked and evil man who has come against the Jewish people. What did they hate Jesus for? Was it because Jesus exposed their wicked hypocrisy? Was it because Jesus came for the poor? For the disinherited? For the despised and the rejected? The work of Jesus was a work of healing. He caused the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak, the lame to walk, and he raised the dead to life. Was not that a good work? But look, they called a man that did a work like that a devil. Read your Bible. They called Jesus a devil. I'm not a Rudy Poop Johnny come lately. I have been working in the black community for 30 long years. You are just like Columbus. You just discovered me yesterday and now you think I just came into existence. That shows you that shows you the racist attitude that it's only when white folk discover you that you're really found. I was in the black community drawing thousands of people and white press wasn't there. I came to City College in 1980 before the Jesse Jackson campaign and drew 12,000 people and turned 2,000 away came back the following year to the armory and packed the armory. The press wasn't there. In 1974, on Randall's Island, we talked to 70,000 black people and you weren't there. You're trying to make it seem as though it is now that I started talking against Jews that I've become popular. You overestimate yourself and you underestimate the black people of America. For 30 years, as a student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I've worked in the black community and no one can deny the effect of the word that I taught from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You may come to hear what Farrakhan has to say and you come in blind with a napkin over your eye. But you go away seeing. You may come deaf, not wanting to hear. Like some of you tonight say, I'm just gonna go sit down and hear what that man gotta say and I'm just gonna fold my hands. I ain't gonna, I ain't, I ain't gonna show nothing. But in a few minutes, you just can't help yourself. You begin patting your foot, clapping your hand. Why? Because if Farrakhan is a deceiver and a liar, the Spirit of God in him can't touch the Spirit of God in you. You are not a foolish people. You can hear, you can see, you can feel, you can touch. Anybody that plays the Apollo Theater knows that the Apollo in Harlem was the litmus test because when you give your approval on something New York, it's all right. It is all right. <laughs> the power of truth opens your ears. And after you hear the truth, your tongue that was knotted with fear is unloosed 
and you speak with the tongue of a free man, you speak the language of truth. And by the grace and power of Almighty God, we are rebuilding the nation of Islam that was destroyed by the federal government of the United States under Hoover's wicked counterintelligence program and by hypocrites who hated my father. I call him my father, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But that nation that you thought you destroyed, here it is again. And even as Jesus was blessed to raise Lazarus from the dead, God is blessing me to raise up a nation of black people who are considered mentally, morally, socially, spiritually, politically, and economically dead. Lazarus was not dead physically. He had a napkin over his eyes. His hands were bound, his feet were bound, and all he needed was to hear his master's voice. So Jesus said to Martha, he's not asleep, he's not dead, he's asleep. And he went to the cave or the tomb where he was and said, Lazarus, come forth. Satan, loose him and let him go. When you hear the voice of truth, the napkin of falsehood that they have tied around your eyes, you pull it off. Your hands bound, your feet bound. But here you come out of the cave, out of the dope den, out of the wine hall, out of the places of ill repute, on your way to the garden. What did you come to hear? What did you come to see? A man shaking in the wind? No, you came to hear that which would give life to black people. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it was then that the authorities said, my God, if we don't stop this man, he'll have the whole world believing in him. Are you listening to me? It was then after he fed the multitude and raised Lazarus from the dead that the people began to suspect that this was the Messiah that they had long been looking for. And so the word went throughout the land and they were saying when he came to Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. He came riding into Jerusalem on an ass. Jerusalem was the capital city of the Jews and New York City is the capital city of Jews in America. This is a modern Jerusalem. And I have come here tonight and you have come out and your words are words of honor, words of praise. You're beginning to suspect that there may be something in this brother from Almighty God for all of us. Even those of you who knew me as the minister of Temple Number 7, you heard your brother, maybe you had a different thought about me. Maybe you began to think I was an evil man. But God would not give me the blessing of resurrection and the power to give life to a dead nation if I was an evil man who didn't love you and was willing to die for you. My life is a testimony that I never was evil. I never did anything but good for the black nation. When the people began praising Jesus, that was just the beginning. That was the signal that he was about to be betrayed. His crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension was to take place, bringing about the judgment and destruction of the wicked. Now, what do we see? If we see the rise of that which was destroyed, and you see a resurrection, more importantly, not a resurrection of that which is narrowly called the nation of Islam, but you see a resurrection in the spirit of the people in general 
to stand up and fight for their own liberation. This is the resurrection of the dead that the scriptures of the Bible and Quran is talking about. When you see your black brothers in South Africa rising up with nothing in their hands, challenging a powerful government that has oppressed them, you are witnessing the resurrection of the dead. In England tonight, your black brothers and sisters in the United Kingdom are rising up against oppression there in England. You started it in the 60s and now your people have caught on in Africa, catching on around the world and it's coming back to you again. Where will you stand? What will you do? This is why Governor Cuomo said, what Farrakhan teaches will tear the country apart. What kind of country do you have? If truth will tear your country apart, your country should never have existed in the first place. Now, brothers and sisters, the Jesus of 2,000 years ago, according to the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to us, and according to history, he never spoke to the multitudes. Not that man 2,000 years ago. There were hardly any multitudes in Palestine. The Jews did not want to hear what he had to say. He was calling them back to the law of Moses that they had rejected. He only taught 35 or 36 people at a time. That poor man suffered much for the truth. But today, thanks to Almighty God, Allah, we're speaking to tens of thousands of people across this nation, and the wicked are very surprised, and they're angry. Because no matter what they've said against me, black people are coming out to hear what we have to say. Listen, this again shows that their propaganda does not have any more effect on the minds of the people. The black leaders that have been their voice against black people don't have any more effect on you. The black leaders, I want to say this, you are finished. Listen. Look here. Black leaders are finished if you stand with the enemy of your people, you finished. You're finished. You can't lead us no more. If you want to be an apologist for white people and condemn your brother without giving me a hearing, most of these leaders have my phone number. They know how to call me. They don't ask me what I said as long as white folk tell them that he said such and such and so and so, condemn him. These silly toms run out and do their master's bidding. I am saying, brothers, brothers and sisters, the reason why a David Dinkins. Now listen, he's my brother and he's getting heavy, heavy to carry. The reason David Dinkins would do that is because they don't fear us, they fear white people. What I'm suggesting to black people is that the leaders have to begin to fear the people that they say they represent. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? No, you don't. Because when the leader sells out the people, he should pay a price for that. Don't you think so? Do you think the leader 
here should sell you out and then live we should make examples of the leaders so that the next one that comes along will respect you enough to do that which pleases the masses of the people Now I know the press is going to have a field day on that tomorrow. But, but, but don't run away now, press. I got something real heavy for you coming in a minute. That's lightweight stuff compared to what I came here to say in New York. Y'all got enough time? Look, who were the enemies of Jesus? The scribes, look at the word scribes. It comes from the Latin word scribo, which means to write. The writers, they were Jesus' enemies. How do the writers treat me? They're my enemies. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, and there was a hypocritical element of the people that were around Jesus that claimed to believe, but they really did not. Now the Jews are going throughout America trying to line up all the black leaders to condemn me, to repudiate me. Some black leaders do so from ignorance. Others do so while they know better. Now the Jews will not come out and challenge me in a substantial way and say, Farrakhan. Don't call me anti-Semitic. Say, Farrakhan, you are a liar. Then present the truth. See, they don't do that. If they had the truth to refute me, they would have used it by now. But the Quran says, when truth comes, falsehood vanishes, and falsehood is forever a vanishing thing. They cannot say that because they don't have the power to condemn what I say. Now this is going to get very heavy in just a minute. I want you to hold on tight here. Hold on. They don't have the power to condemn me, so they falsely label me. And they use the stranglehold that they have over the government. Did you hear what I said? The Jewish lobby has a stranglehold on the government. 246 members of the House of Representatives are honorary members of the Israeli Knesset. And 46 United States Senators are honorary members of the Knesset. This is why whatever they want, they get it because the president himself is actually punking out to the Jewish lobby. The president. And let me tell you, selling America right on down the tube. Not only don't they want you to hear what I have to say, they don't want common white people to hear what I have to say because my dear 5% brothers of the 5% nation in your lessons who is the 85% who is the 10% and who is the 5% look at it if you notice, no color is used in the number. 
85% of the masses of black people have been deceived. 85% of the masses of white people have been deceived. 85% of the human family of the earth has been deceived. And there's a small clique of 10% who know the truth, who know the living God, but are blood suckers of the poor and keep the poor ignorant to the knowledge of God and the knowledge of the truth. Bear with me because it's going to get a little heavier than what it is right now. I would like to warn the leaders, you know, don't do this because you're making yourself worthy of hell. Just remember, black leaders, what is going on in South Africa. Your brothers in South Africa are trying to get to the real oppressor, but they're killing the buffer to get to the oppressor. And you know who the buffer is? It's these privileged Negroes who become apologists for a system of oppression a system of apartheid, a system that is unjust. And so I say to all of you, your excuses are ended. Yeah? If you join with the enemies of truth, then you will put yourself into the chastisement of Allah. You will not escape. You will suffer great loss, ruin, and ultimately a disgraceful death if you reject the truth and join with the enemies to condemn a man that only seeks your liberation. I say this very humbly. Please listen. I am your last chance. Listen. Every black leader that ever stood up for you, you helped to kill your own leaders at the insistence of your open enemy. You can't be charged with it for yesterday because we were ignorant. We didn't, we were not awake. But today, If you join your enemy to kill a just man, then the pain of what your fathers deserve for killing and betraying Nat Turner, then my visit, Gabriel Prosser, Booker T, W.E.B., Marcus Garvey, Noble Drew Ali, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, all of it will come down on this generation. I'm your last chance. God is ending your excuses. You can't say the brother is not articulate. God makes me to make it so plain, even a fool can't miss it. You can't say He's an ugly dude. God makes me pleasant for you to look at. Though, though I don't consider myself the equal of none of those men that I call. I come at the right time. I come in the fullness of time when it all has to be wrapped up. And because I'm on time, I will be more successful than all those that went before me because the time is right, the season is right, you are right, the conditions are right. We must go free now. Now is the time.
All praise is due to Allah. Bear with me. I'm not only the last chance for you, I'm the last chance for the government of the United States of America. I want you to hear what I'm saying, America, because you kill everybody that will give you the truth that will correct your wickedness. But if you make a move toward me, which you have already planned to do, you have sat down, Reagan, with your chiefs of staff to figure out the Farrakhan problem. I'm warning you, Mr. Reagan, and I'm warning the government of America, this body you cannot have. You have killed your last black leader when you killed Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Look. The Jews talk about never again. I'm very sorry. I am your last dance too, Jews. I am your last chance. Listen, Jews. This little black boy is your last chance. Why do I say your last chance? Because the scriptures charge your people with killing the prophets of God. And if you want to show the world that you are better than your fathers, I am not a prophet, but I come in the footsteps of those worthies. And if you rise up to try to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, then Allah promises you that he will bring to bear on this generation the blood of the righteous, not just from Abel to Zechariah, but from Abel all the way to the last man you killed recently. you will be killed outright. I'm going to say that again. You cannot say never again to God because when he puts you in the oven, you're in one indeed. And your Bible, listen, I'm not making any mockery. Never again don't mean a damn thing when God get ready for you. Your Bible teaches you, Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all that do wicked, yea, the proud, shall be like stubble, and he will cut you off and leave you neither root nor branch. This is prophesied for you, and I'm your last chance. If you fool with me, you're courting with death itself. This is why I will not run from you. I will run to you. You know, we have a paper called The Final Call. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad sat with me one day and said if there was any symbol that could re represent his work, it would be a trumpet. Because the trumpet is the sign of the resurrection of the dead. Your Bible teaches you that a man named Gabriel would blow his horn and the dead would arise. Don't you think it's some uh, 
What's that great black trumpeter, Louis Armstrong? Don't you think Satchmo is coming back from the grave to blow no trumpet and some dead folk in the cemetery gonna get up? That means a man of God will stand up with a brassy truth in his mouth. Nobody can sleep when a trumpet is sounding. So it stirs up white folk, it stirs up black folk, it stirs up everybody. But the final call cannot be sounded forever. When a final call is given, there's a time when the trumpet has to cease. And when I said that this is the last great speech or the last speech that I will give for a long time, that means it's time to put the trumpet up because there's another trumpet that comes behind the sound of my voice. And that trumpet is that death and destruction that is prophesied for America and for you. I know you, beloved, you are good people, but you will not be good on a word alone. It's gonna take a whipping to get you right with Almighty God. So I am putting up the trumpet so that God can do his work. And I'm saying this, just if you doubt what I'm saying, after I speak tonight and stop my talk inside America, watch what God brings down on America. Just watch it. You say, who do you think you are? Just your brother. But I'm nothing that's backed by power. You see. And so that second trumpet is about to play its notes. Now, beloved, I hope you are all right. Because now phase two of this lecture we're already over time, we're going to have to pay the money. But there's something I want to say. You know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a very wonderful man, but he's a very misunderstood man, even by many of us who followed him. We really didn't understand it. Seven weeks ago, I was privileged to visit the holy city of Mecca for the third time, but this was the best of all because I made Hajj. As the guest of the World Muslim League and its Secretary General, Dr. Nasif, Nasif, I shared an experience with nearly two million Muslims from around the world. And that experience touched me profoundly. Although this is, was my third trip to Mecca, this Hajj profoundly deepened my love for the Muslim world. My respect for the Muslim world, it deepened my love and respect for Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And what he came to give this world. I hardly can say the words la baik Allahumma la baik without tears coming into my eyes because the pilgrimage to Mecca made by Muslims is such a profound experience Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, institutionalized all the principles of Islam in one great principle. In the pilgrimage to Mecca, it is a sign of the journey of man from sperm to his meeting with his Lord. Man must come through trial and tribulation as sperm, as clot, as embryo, as fetus, as child, as youngster, as adult, to maturity. He's still moving on till he can say, La baik Allah, humma la baik. Here I am, O Allah, in your august presence. Man's movement is from nothing to meet with God. 
Man's movement is from a tiny microscopic germ to the perfection of his being in the presence of Allah. Listen, beloved, listen, please. When I was in Mecca, there was a beautiful Muslim brother there who challenged me and said, brother, when you get back to America, you must denounce Elijah Muhammad as kafir, unbeliever. I looked at my brother in that sacred valley of Mecca, I said to him, brother, I could never denounce my father. And I will never denounce the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as an unbeliever. Listen, beloved, I appeal to you. I appeal to Mecca. I appeal to my Muslim brothers and sisters. I appeal to my Christian brothers and sisters. Open your mind just a little. I think you need to hear from me about my father because I don't hate him. I love that man. I know what he did for me. I know how misunderstood he's been. But God has blessed me to see him deeper now than I saw him then. And I want to share with you, whether you are rejected or not, I want to share with you what God has helped me and blessed me to see. Beloved, listen. This man, Elijah Muhammad, has produced a child, a son from himself, from his own mind, and from the blessing of Almighty God. And that child is Farrakhan. I'm not denying his other children, but I know he produced me. And I know, beloved brothers and sisters, when they asked me in Mecca, take the Shahada, I said, my dear brother, I took that a long time ago. You say to me, beloved, that I am not a faithful man. But if I challenge the most wicked of governments and the most oppressive force in the world on a daily basis, my faith in my God, Allah, is being tested. I have no army. I am alone. I don't fear anyone but Allah. Some of you are tested, all Muslims are tested. The Quran says at least once a year, you are tested severely, a Muslim. Some of us have not stood up to little tests. In the Islamic world, you bow down to the power of America. I don't bow down, but I don't know God. You know him better than I. I will not bend my knees to the power of the Jews or anybody else. You bend and you bow, but I don't know Allah. I don't know his prophet. I will not smoke, drink, use drugs, chase women or men. But I don't know God. Now, if my father produced a child that is challenging the wickedness of a world and God is blessing me with success for no one can give you success but Allah and none could give us victory over these enemies tonight but Allah. It is not because I am an unbeliever. It is because I put my trust completely in Allah. When he says, fear me and me alone should you fear. Don't set up no rival with me, no partner with me. I am one and I have no equal. I believe that with all my being that there is no God but Allah.
Now listen. Beloved, you must try to understand the profound way that Elijah Muhammad brought us an approach to Islam. Notice what I said, an approach. Because here's a people totally destroyed. The black people in America are in worse condition than any people that ever received a prophet. The Arabs in their state of Jahiliya were in better condition than the black people in America for the Arabs were in their own country Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not opposed by a wicked government. He was opposed by the tribe of his own tribe, the Quraysh. But these black people, in order to be free, have to challenge the most powerful and wicked government on earth. And they must challenge him, and they are mentally dead and totally destroyed as a people. Listen to me, please. Elijah Muhammad said to us that we, the black people in America, are the people that fulfill Abraham's seed and the vision of Abraham. Now, if we are wrong, then don't call me anti Semitic. Say it's a theological argument, and let's argue it out theologically. I'm not speaking with hate, but this Quran, come on Muslims, this Quran in the second surah chapter, Abraham prays that Allah would accept his work and Ishmael's work of rebuilding the sacred house, the Kaaba. Abraham prays that Allah would turn mercifully to him and show him his way of devotion. Abraham prayed that God would make him a Muslim and raise from his offspring a nation of Muslims. Not a tribe, but a nation of Muslims. Elijah Muhammad was not wrong when he said we the black people of America are the lost found members of the nation of Islam Islam means all the believers in Allah and his prophet Muhammad peace be upon him whether they're black brown red yellow or white they are in the nation of Islam you are lost and we cannot reconnect the lost brother with the nation of Islam the broad nation until he is resurrected and reformed then he can be reconnected so the process that Elijah Muhammad had to go through is a process of resurrection reformation then development then reconnection are you listening? Yeah. Hear me now. Allah says to Muhammad that his covenant does not include the wrongdoers. The Arab world, the Muslim world has deviated from this Quran and from the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad. I am not talking about the sunnah of his dress, the sunnah of his personal care and way. I'm talking about the principles that undergird everything that the prophet said, everything that he did. It is rooted in universal principle. And when you don't apply the principle that is found in his example, you deviate from the word so the Quran is treated as a forsaken book by most Muslims. Prophet Muhammad himself said, three generations after me 
will no longer be of me. So you have the four rightly guided caliphs and several after and for 300 years the scholars say they tried to live pure to Prophet Muhammad's word. Then they began to deviate. Wealth corrupted them, power corrupted them and Islam had a setback for 1,000 years. You cannot deny this Muslims. The Bible says, know of a surety, Abraham, your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. And they will serve the stranger 400 years and they'll be afflicted for that same amount of time. But after that time, God would come and judge the nation which Abraham's seed would serve. Arabs, you were not in bondage in any strange land for no 400 years. But it is Jews, you were not in bondage in no strange land for 400 years. But our fathers were brought here to America on a ship named Jesus in the year 1555. And we've been here now for 430 years under affliction in a strange land. So when I say to the Jews, the black people are the chosen people of God, Wait a minute, Muslims say God does not have a chosen people. No, no, no. God chose the Arabs. And he said, you are an exalted nation, the Muslims. You are an exalted nation that I, Allah, may be a bearer of witness to you, that you may be bearers of witness to the people. But when that exalted nation fell and failed in their duty to be a witness bearer to the ends of the earth, a prophet Muhammad's example and this Quran, then the covenant of God did not include you. He leaves you and he finds another people who will bring in the fruit of what he has. And I'm saying that Allah has shown mercy and beneficence to this lost black nation in the West that the whole world hates and despises. Listen to me, please. I know this is an economic message I'm supposed to give you, and I'll get to it in a minute. But beloved, I want you to be patient with me tonight. You got a little time? I won't be but about a half hour more. Can you stand? Can you hang for a half hour? All right, listen to what I'm saying. Muslims, in Prophet Muhammad's last speech, Prophet Muhammad said, and I'm quoting, there is no superiority of the Arab over the non-Arab or the white over the black. Is that what he said? Yes. Prophet Muhammad was not leading us to a vision of white supremacy or black supremacy. Prophet Muhammad was leading the world to a vision where men would be judged on their dutifulness and on their piety. So he said the best of you is he who is most careful of his duty, not he who is the blackest, not he who is the whitest, not he who has the most money, but the most honorable among you is the most dutiful among you. Is that what he said? All right, listen, brothers and sisters. Why did Prophet Muhammad say the Arab is not better than the non-Arab? Because the Arab was chosen to receive this book. This book, Quran, is such a powerful book. When you receive it, it raises you up. And when this book elevates you, you can become arrogant and proud. And the power that you get from being chosen could slip away from you because you become corrupt. So Prophet Muhammad was saying, don't you think because you're an Arab, you have superiority over the non-Arab, that means you've got a duty to perform. And if you fail in your duty, you fail in the covenant. But why did he say there's no superiority in the white over the black? In that time in Arabia, Black people were not on it. Bilal had a hell of a time. Didn't he, brothers and sisters? Bilal, listen to me, beloved Muslims, please. 
I love you, but I got to tell the truth. Prophet Muhammad was a man with a pure heart. Prophet Muhammad never wanted to see black and white fighting each other for supremacy. So he told the white, don't feel you're better because you're white, that you are better and more privileged than your dark-skinned Muslim brother. Prophet Muhammad met racism already in the world. It had been in the world nearly 4,000 years before Prophet Muhammad was born. But Prophet Muhammad and this book was to end racism. As in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., he longed for the day when a man would be judged. Not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. Look at this now. This book, Quran, was to bring about that vision. Oh, please be patient with me, brother and sister. Please be patient. Listen now. White people feel superior to black people. Isn't that true? Now, I, I'm sorry I have to say this, but I have to say it. There are light-skinned Arabs who do not feel that black people are their equal, even in Islam. No, no, no. I know what Islam teaches, but I know what you practice. And it is the practice of Muslims that have dirtied the religion. It is the practice of Jews that have dirtied the religion. It is the practice of Christians that have dirtied the religion. The religion is pure, but when we misapply it, use it for worldly purposes rather than the purpose for which God intended it, we make it a dirty religion. And this is why people reject religion today because religion has been made dirty by the practitioners of religion. Are you listening to me? Just a few more minutes, please. Not only do white people feel they're better than blacks, but all of the lighter skinned people of the earth look at black people as though we are nothing, never were nothing. And when they are with us, they smile, they act cordial, but deep down inside, most of the people of the earth feel that black people are absolutely inferior. And religion don't blot it out. I don't care whether it's Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism. You feel you're better than the black people of the earth. And that is a reality. Now, listen to me, please. And I don't want to tire you out. I really don't. But this is my last major speech, and I hope you'll be patient. Brothers and sisters, if this book is to be made real, someone has to destroy the mentality in whites and light-skinned people that blacks are inferior. And someone must destroy forever in black people that you are some reject of the creator. Now, with that as a backdrop, with that as a backdrop, listen to me. A man came from Mecca, Farad Muhammad, a light-skinned Arab whose father was a black man, an original black man, and his mother was a Caucasian. Farad Muhammad came in 1930 and he taught Elijah Muhammad that the black man is the original man. Listen. And he referred to the black man as God. 
Now, wait, wait, wait. Now, I want you to hear me. Listen, now, don't get excited, Muslims. Please don't get excited. Don't get excited. Listen to me, please. Listen, please. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. I want you to listen. I want to walk a little and talk to you. Just give me a little room here, that's right. Look, brothers and sisters, the aim of this teaching was not to make racists. Well, even if that wasn't the aim, that's what happened. It's true, it did happen. Why? Because a child has to grow to understand the depth of wisdom. When you put a jewel of wisdom in a child's hand, the child may misuse it until he learns how to use it. We were not given this teaching so that we could walk around macho and put on white folk what white folk had put on us. But that teaching was to break up a mind that was in the world that was based on falsehood. Now look, there is no scholar today that will deny what Elijah Muhammad says. They have studied it biologically, genetically, mathematically, historically, anthropologically, the black man was here on this earth before any other people were on this earth. The black man is in fact the original man. Now look, listen to me. I want you to listen. You say, Brother Farrakhan, this is anti-Islam. Hold it a minute. Hold it a minute. In the Quran, the original man of the Quran is called Adam. You don't talk about Adam's color. You say Adam is the first man. Some of the Islamic scholars say Adam was a prophet. Farrakhan says to you in humility, no, he was not. Why should you call Adam a prophet? Prophets have to have a precondition that calls them into existence. If there were no people on the earth before Adam, then there was no one for Adam to reform, no one for Adam to teach. So don't call Adam a prophet. Adam was the firstborn of Allah. He was born in the nature of the God himself. He's a human being, but he has the potential to be God. Listen to me, I'm not crazy, I'm not un-Islamic, I'm right on it. Your Quran, my Quran says, when Allah made Adam, he made him from the dust. He made him from black mud and he fashioned him into shape. Isn't that right? he made him he didn't send no prophet to talk to him he talked direct to Adam himself Adam had direct communication with the Lord of creation and the Lord of creation taught Adam the names of the angels and told Adam go to the angels and tell them their names he was made wiser than the angels then the Lord of creation asked the angels to bow down to Adam. Well, if the angels have bowed down to Adam, then Adam was given supremacy over the forces of nature. He's made a God, for God can't produce nothing but a God. But remember, we say, Ashadu in la ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. You're a God, but you're not the supreme one. 
so you bow down too. Now look, that this Quran says that you and I have the potential to be that. Is that right? How does that tie in with what Elijah Muhammad said? Elijah Muhammad said the black man is the original man. Your Bible says from one blood came all human beings. The Quran says he created man from a single essence. Then he spread forth families. And the Quran says he made you into tribes and families. And the Bible says he separated the sons of Adam. If two white people cannot produce yellow, much less black, if two yellow people can't produce brown, much less black, then the black man is the original man. He's the Adam. This is why the Quran calls him a man having the nature of God. You don't have to join Islam. You are born by nature a Muslim. All you have to do is be yourself. You are the righteous. You are the powerful. But your power is dormant. Why did he reveal such teaching? To say to the Arab who spit upon black people, to say to the Chinese and the Japanese and other people of color, behold your father. Without us, none of you could have come into existence. We are the Adam. And we have the potential to become like God. Well, Farrakhan, why are you saying this now? I'm also going to say this. There is no superiority of the black over the white. Because you are the father, that doesn't make you superior to other people. Your superiority can only be if you are more righteous and more dutiful. And if you are chosen to do a job that you will stand up for God and do your duty by all of humanity and treat every human being the way you would like to be treated. I am not a racist. I will treat a white man like I want to be treated and I will honor him and respect him if he's worthy of honor and if he submits to the will of God. He is my brother even though he is white. He is my brother in the faith. Islam well how did you all become so racist it is because listen carefully the Jews were given a book listen to me carefully now listen to my words the Quran says, and a party of them, not all of them, a party of them heard the word, understood it, then changed it. Now listen to me. Anytime you take God's word, which is pure, and you alter it, change it, you start making devils. Are you listening to me? When you heard Elijah Muhammad say, who is the original man, the Asiatic black man, the owner, the maker, the cream of the planet, the God of the universe, who is the colored man, Yaqub's grafted devil, the skunk of the planet Earth? Let's understand that now from a more mature level. Are you with me? The original thing in the universe is truth. If you keep it in its purity, you make a righteous people. 
when you start tampering with the truth, mixing it, diluting it, adding in and taking away from it, you start altering the truth, coloring the truth, and you start making a colored people. You start making devils. You start making skunks. As a skunk is attractive, he has a nasty smell. And as you can be mixed with truth and falsehood, you may look good, but your actions stink in the nostrils of civilized people. Now here, I'm, I'm, I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. Just hold on a little longer, brothers and sisters. Hold on. Now, Elijah Muhammad said, the white man is the devil. Now wait, you call that hate. But Elijah Muhammad showed white people a mirror. The truth is, the criterion of judgment is what God has sent down through his prophets. And if you measure white people up against the Torah and the law, the Injil or the Good News, or this book, the Quran, which is the criterion, they are absolutely devils. Listen, no, 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 listen, listen. Are you saying all of them? I'm saying that those few that are trying to be good are so few and of such little effect, it is as though they don't even exist. Listen, but what Elijah Muhammad couldn't say to black people, he couldn't say to you, with all that had been heaped upon you, that you had been made devils also. You were not strong enough to take that kind of truth, but by feeding you lies, mixed with truth, making you hate your black self, destroy one another, envious and jealous of one another, he actually made you little devils. So America had become a habitation of devils, black ones and white ones, and all of you who come into America from wherever you live, you follow the mentality of America so you become the same old blue-eyed devil that they are. Now what did he mean, blue-eyed devil? Listen now, what do you mean blue-eyed devil? Some of you look at people with actual blue eyes, you say, there's the blue-eyed devil. It could be, but it ain't necessarily so. You didn't hear me. You know what blue means? The sky looks blue, don't it? The ether in the sky makes it look blue. Run out there and try and chase the blue, you never find it. Because blue is a color of deceit. The Quran says we take Allah's color. Since Allah is the only reality, if you allow Allah the best knower to teach you, then you see everything as it is. But when your mind is colored with truth mixed with falsehood, your eyes begin getting blurry, your vision gets dim, your eyes get blue, meaning you are self-deluded or you have been deceived. And so the whole world has been deceived by a small click, 10% who know the truth and hide it. They are the blood suckers of the poor. And now you wonder why they are so upset with Farrakhan? It is because I, like Jesus, say to them, I know you. You are of your father, the devil. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And you, Yaqub, Yaqub is another word for Jacob. Jacob the supplanter, Jacob the man that wrestled with the angel and after he wrestled with the angel and prevailed, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. A supplanter, a liar, a murderer. Now you wanna call me anti-Semitic. 
Well, if I'm anti-Semitic for talking about the transgression of Jews, then burn your Bibles. Because the Bible from the book of Revelation all the way to Genesis talks about Jewish transgression. Then nobody should read the Bible. It is an anti-Semitic book. Don't read the Quran. The Quran starts off in the second surah talking about the transgressions of Israel. How she altered the word of God. Wrote a book with her own hands and gave it to the people as though it's God's book. Now you're a so-called Christian and you have not been shaped in the lifestyle of Jesus. You have been shaped in the lifestyle of hell itself but Jesus' good name is hanging over you. You have been deceived. Christians looking for a heaven too high and a hell too low and a devil that's too spooky. You've been deceived. And they know that we know. And they know that I am not afraid to tell the truth regardless of the cost. And they know that I will tell it and am telling it. I'm not making this up. Go read your Bible. Jesus condemned them as devils in the plainest language. I say the same today. They have no respect for truth. I watched a rabbi, a devil rabbi. Listen to what I said. A devil rabbi argue with Reverend Butts coming to defend his position on the basis of a lie. I never called Judaism a gutter religion. I said the practice of lying, stealing, murder, and deceit and using God's holy name to shield your dirty religion, not the practice of the scripture, but your dirty practices using God's holy name. Do you hear what I'm saying? But they have no respect for the truth. I said Hitler was a wickedly great man. I didn't make a mistake. I know the language. You taught it to me, white folks. Now all of a sudden you got dumb to the meaning of what great is. There was an earthquake in Mexico the other day. It was a severe or major earthquake. Then they upgraded it to 8.1 on the Richter scale and they called it a great earthquake. Does that mean it was a good one? It was a great earthquake, but it wasn't a good one because it killed thousands of people, didn't it? But it was great in that it had far-reaching implications because the government of Mexico has been corrupt for years. And the poor people of Mexico, with their warm, loving spirit, have never risen up as a revolutionary against that government. So God took up for the people. And one morning, 719, he sent a quake that actually destroyed the government buildings, toppled the, the television station, all of their communications. Now the government is rocking with an earthquake. It's a sign to you, America. These innocent people may not rise up against you, but God will strike your government because this government deceives the American people. It has boys and girls fighting in wars, supposedly for democracy, but these are wars calculated by that wicked 10% who are the blood suckers of the poor of the earth. And they send your son to Vietnam to die in a war. For what? To come back crippled and crazy in a war. For what? They call me anti-American because I say, you will never send my sons. You will never send my sons. And if I were young enough, you would never send me. I want to know, is it a real war 
that America is being threatened or is it that the raw materials of the rich are being taken away by the rising up of the people of the earth? And so, beloved, the closing part of this lecture has to deal with economics. Brothers and sisters, you will never be free as long as black leaders and black organizations pay homage to others other than you. Jewish control of black organizations has to be busted up and broken. Listen, the old Jewish relationship with black people has to be changed. We don't want to relate to Jews on a master-slave relationship because our time to be free men and women has come and we refuse to compromise. Our black artists got to come back home to us, not under the control of others who suck all the blood from the black community. The artist gets rich and then burns it up in coke because he has no cause to live for bigger than himself. They don't allow black artists to be political, to stand up for their own people. Michael Jackson should take a stand for black people, take a stand for the suffering people of South Africa, Azania. Prince should take a stand. All of our black artists should take a stand, but they can't because they're threatened. If you take a stand, we'll cut your money. Stevie stood up and made a song. Apartheid is wrong, wrong, wrong. And immediately his records were banned in South Africa and the federal government is moving in on Stevie talking about taxes why the hell don't you move in on me I'm waiting on you IRS because when you come and you are on your way I will show you why no black man or woman in America should pay any taxes to a government that will not give us justice. No black people should pay. Why should we pay? Pay taxes for a police department that kills our grandmothers, kills our babies, shoots us down pay the salary of unjust judges, pay for American planes to bomb Tunisia, to bomb Lebanon. Hell no. Brothers and sisters, if you don't stand up, you'll always be the laughing stock of the world. I say, but if we stand up like men, stand up like women, we'll back the enemy up and Allah will give us victory after victory after victory. Now in my conclusion. Marcus Garvey wanted us to go back to Africa. Abraham Lincoln wanted the same thing. Marcus Garvey said, Let's return to Mother Africa. Don't run, brothers and sisters. I mean, look, if you go out into the night quiet, believe me, when this message is over, you get uptown, cross town, you're going to feel so good. You won't even be able to sleep because you ain't tired. When you wake up in the morning, go face white folks. They say, did you go to the garden last night? Tell them I was there, baby. And that man don't teach hate. That man teach black people to love one another. Look, brothers and sisters, a few quick points. Garvey said we should go back to Africa. Elijah Muhammad said we should be separated in a state or territory of our own, either here or elsewhere. Let's reason with those two solutions. How many of you in here right now now, I want you to be truth. Would like to return to Africa to build a new nation for yourself. Raise your hand. Okay, now, 
I would say, as a representative, about 25, 30% of this audience. That's not bad. But the rest of you, you don't want to go no place. Wait, 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 listen, let me, listen now. But that's cool, I want to talk to both of you. Listen, please listen now, it's very critical. If America agreed to ship us all back, and we agreed to go, it would take all the navies of the whole world cooperating together for a few generations to get 40 million people back to Africa. The truth of the matter is, there may not be an African government right now that's willing to take all of us, but there are governments that's willing to take some of us. And listen now, if America said, we know we've treated you wrong, we don't like you, we don't want you, we don't have anything more for you Negroes to do, so we're going to give you Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. Y'all had that. Now, the white folks that are moved out, they would be just like the Palestinians who were moved out of their homeland. They would be very revolutionary, very angry. It would tear America up. Even though it's just that America let us go, she's too afraid to do that because she's afraid that you may join on to an enemy and remember her evil and come against her so she don't want to let you go. Now, there's a third alternative. We get $204 billion out of the American economy. That's a lot of money. Making us the 14th richest nation on the earth if you compare what we get out of the American economy to the gross national product of the nations of the earth. We're very rich and we have a potential for great power within the United States. Now America says that we can do business. That's what she says. She don't have any jobs for us and it doesn't look like she'll have any. She says our children are doomed to be poor. That means as long as we depend on them, our children will be poor. But when we decide to take our future into our own hands, we can end poverty and want among us by marshalling our own producing power and doing something for ourselves. Now here's two things that I propose. In a few days, Africa is going to get real strong because revolution is sweeping Africa and it's going to sweep out all the leaders that are controlled by the West and powerful new leaders are going to take over in Africa. And those powerful new leaders in Africa have a heart for their kith and their kin that have been spread out in the diaspora. Now look, all those who said they would like to go and build a new nation, I think we could talk to the OAU in time and ask them, since we didn't give up our right to the homeland if they would set aside some land for us that is fertile has some mineral strength riches in it with an outlet to the sea and those of us who are dissatisfied here we go on back home to build a nation for ourselves and give ourselves the rights that white people have been denying us if that ever happened I would go immediately to whoever the president is and I would say, look, sir, give me some water. You got over 400,000 black men in prisons. I want you to give me all you got in the prisons. Since you don't want them, we know we can reform them. You got them doing five, 10, 20 years in a jail. Give them to us and the same amount of time they got in jail, give them that same amount of time to work building a new nation for their people. And the same money that America uses to support one convict, 
which is more than it takes to give you a college education, give us that money for the new territory. Don't say it can't be done because there's a precedent for it. America was established by the convicts and the dregs of Europe. They let them out of the prisons and told them, come over and build a new nation. And look what you have today. Now, those of us that want to stay in America, you got to make a strategic alliance with the Native Americans. Because God is going to give the land back to the original owner, the Indians and the Chicanos. Yes. And if we want to live here, we ought to make some kind of peace with the landlords. Now, once there's a strategic alliance between the black and the red in America, they are on reservations that have the last mineral wealth of this country. With the technology of the blacks and some of the millions that some of the Indians have, with the resources of the Indian reservation, we could form a strategic alliance that would be beneficial to the black, the red, and the brown. Now the government of America is about to evict the Navajos off their land in Big Mountain in Arizona. Next year they're going to send the army in. I have pledged that if Allah spares my life, I'm going to be there on that Indian reservation. Look here. I feel that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that they wouldn't kill more than 300 Muslims and Allah will kill all of them. So I'm one that's willing to give my life and all I need is 299 more with me and we'll stand up with the American Indians for their land and if we die on the land together you know how they do it in the Indian tradition if you cut your wrist and some of your blood flow into my blood we become what? Brothers. So if both of us die to preserve and protect and defend the land, then the Indians have to say to the bloods, some of this is yours. Now, beloved, this is not a pipe dream. Schultz just told Bota, you got to get up off apartheid or your government is finished. Something is going on in South Africa that they're not telling you and me. Now that's a powerful government down there. But the brothers and sisters keeping up their march, they're bringing that government down. I'm saying to America, we are willing to do for ourselves. We know we have the potential to do for ourselves. All we need to do is marshal our purchasing power, redirect it back into our own communities. We can build institutions. We can buy farms to feed ourselves. We can do anything that it takes to make ourselves economically independent. Now look, Elijah Muhammad came up with a three-year economic savings plan. You know you ain't about to save no money. Even though he said five cents a day, 25 cents a week, one dollar a month, we could put that in a national treasure inside of one year, five million black wage earners would have a treasury of sixty million dollars which would allow us to set up our own banking system because you putting your money in banks that don't think nothing of us, don't serve us, don't serve our own community. We need to have banking institutions of our own. But I'm gonna say right here and now that the black banks you got to be a little stronger than what you are. You a bunch of scared to death Negroes and you will never be free as a scared to death Negro with a bank under you that they threaten you that they're gonna close your bank. Don't you know when the people are behind you they can't close down a damn thing? Don't you realize brother and sister, look here. If several million black people in America line up behind me, if just one million line up behind me, 
Don't you know we change laws? We write new ones? Laws are made by people. When people are united and organized, we change everything, brother and sister. You are weak because you're disorganized. And you're disorganized because you don't know enough of the truth of the knowledge of yourself. And you refuse to submit to leadership that is your own, that is good for you. Now, beloved, listen. The three-year economic program was good principally, but you're not going to save any money. So what we thought of, Brother Al Wellington, and a group called the Wellington Group, came up with a beautiful idea called People Organized and Working for Economic Rebirth based on the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. All we have to do is marshal some of our purchasing power and start producing some of the things that we all already are spending money for. You spent $400 million last year just for toothpaste. You spent nearly $800 million for mouthwash. God knows what you spent on toilet paper and sisters' sanitary napkins, but we don't make none of this. Since you got to use these things, why shouldn't we produce it and we use it? Now look, if all of us use our own toothpaste, our own mouthwash, our own toilet paper, our own soap, our own sanitary napkins, look how much money is coming into our own coffer. Then before you know it, you'll be strong enough to set up your own national banking system. Then you put your money in your own bank. These Negro banks that are scared of Gaddafi, scared of Arabs, I'm not. Mr. Gaddafi, here's the banking system. You got any extra money you want to drop in the bank? Saudi Arabia, how you doing, my Muslim brother? You got over $246 billion between Saudi and the Emirates in banks controlled by Jews. Come on and put that money in this black national banking system. Why not, brothers and sisters? Why not? Then you go and farm. You must take your mouth out of the kitchen of your enemy. He is killing us through chemical death. You and I must go to the earth and farm and produce our own food needs. These clothing that you have on, this is not good for you. I mean, I have an artist choking me up. But this is part of the language. I speak the language of the people to whom I'm sent. So I dress in a manner that you don't think I'm strange. If I put on the regular garment of the Muslim world and I come to you, you might say, hey, this cat is real strange. He looks too strange for me to listen to. So I come like you, boy looks like one of us. I guess I'd have to take the bow tie off and put a straight tie on. But I can come to you, you can look past my clothes, but you hear what I'm saying. The garment that our women are wearing is atrocious. Dear sisters, these freaks from Paris should not style clothing for you. They put clothing on our women that makes you merchandise rather than a human being. You got to come out of being a piece of meat for men to look at and size you up and say, oh, that's the way she looks under all that stuff, huh? Uh, she sure is fine. We don't want that. Cover yourself. Man want to know you, let him get acquainted with you. Not here. Not here. Here. Let him get acquainted with your mind. When he gets acquainted with your mind, he's gotten acquainted with the real you. When he falls in love with your mind, he falls in love with the real you. And this is the only part of you 
that he will never fully know. The physical part, he'll know in a little while and get tired of. But it's your mind that is as infinite as God himself. And this is what you must acquaint even one with my mind. It continues to grow. It is infinite as God is. Do you understand? Now I'd like to know, brothers and sisters, if we produced our own toothpaste, would you scrub your teeth with your own toothpaste? I mean, if we had some power deodorant, would you use it? God knows we need it. If we had soap that we produce, would you bathe with it? We're not going to put any chemical death on you. We're going to make it exactly according to what is good for our health. Now, suppose millions of us bought these things. White folks try to say, I'm in the toilet business. We're in the toiletry business. They're trying to make mockery, but they won't make mockery of Procter & Gamble. They don't make mockery of Scott tissue paper. But you mock black people who want to make a beginning to do for ourselves. We threw away enough money last year, brothers and sisters, to own all three networks. You spent $9 billion last year on alcohol, $4 billion on tobacco, and nearly $15 billion on illicit drugs. Nearly $30 billion poor people threw away on foolishness. Don't you think we ought to be a little more wise with the money we have and use it to build black people up? <laughs> Look, have the Jews come to economic strength in your community? Are the Arabs now coming to economic strength in your community? Are the Koreans and the Vietnamese coming to strength in your community? Well then don't blame them. You should come to strength in your own community by setting up the kind of goods and services that black folk need. You that are in business, here's how power works. If you become a member of power, and we become a member of power. If we trade with you, you give us a discount for trading with you, then you start getting more and more of the power members trading with a power member. If you're a power doctor, we want to get some medical attention, we go to you, you give us a discount. We go to the dentist, you give us a discount. What is that for? That's training black people to trade with their own. The more we spend our money among our own, the stronger we get. Now the stronger we get economically, the stronger we get politically. Right now, our political weakness sentences thousands of people to death in Azania or South Africa. If we were strong economically and strong politically, we could leverage that political and economic strength on the government and force America to come out of this constructive engagement and deal effectively with South Africa. But we are sentencing our own brothers and sisters to death by our own economic and political weakness. Now I know it's late, late, late. One thing I want to say, two things. Did you know we got five black manufacturers that said they were willing to manufacture these products? Did you know, wait a minute, don't clap yet. Did you know that the Jews and the government is putting pressure on these black manufacturers? to get them not to manufacture our products? Gaddafi loaned me five million dollars. I put it in a black bank, getting less money in interest than we could get in a white bank. The government moved in on the banker, frightened the hell out of them, making them think they're going to put me in jail tomorrow or the day after. 
and those poor black bankers with five million dollars is sitting there trembling do you know it's hard to help you because you're too afraid to be helped now I want to say this to the government we're not selling dope you won't stop the dope merchant you won't stop the pimps you won't stop the destroyers of our people and the purveyors of filth but now that Farrakhan is lifting the hope of black people you want to frighten a black manufacturer from making a product that will get black people up what do you want us to do? What do you expect us to do? Look, we want to do it peacefully. You say you don't have no more jobs for us. We want to create jobs for ourselves. You don't want us in your schools. We want to build schools for ourselves. You mistreat us in your hospitals. We want to make hospitals of our own. You poison us with chemical death, so we want to raise crops to feed ourselves, clothe ourselves, and shelter ourselves. You mean to tell me you're going to stop us from doing that? Will you do that, America? Will you stop us from doing business? Then if you do, what should our response be? What did you say? What did you say? I don't think I heard that. Look, if the white man don't want us to do something for ourselves, sentencing our children to poverty and death, how long can we stand by and let this happen? Is this what you want, America? Do you want your slave to rise up and go to war with you? I think that's what you want. So you can kill off a bunch of us and feel justified. But you're mistaken in your mind. These are the people of God. If we go to war with you, we will win. There are nearly 40 million of us. But you can't win against us. How many times has Allah taken a small number of people and vanquished a huge army of people if that small number had faith in Almighty God? What do you think the story in the Bible about David and Goliath is all about? America's a big old Goliath. The whole world of black people is scared of America. Back up. You scared of America. Scared to stand up like a man and a woman. Well, I say to you, stand back. I stand up to America by myself with the help of Almighty God. I got the slingshot. And I got the five smooth stones. And I'm bringing her to her knees by the power of Almighty God because there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And as long as we believe in Allah, we will win. And so my beloved, fear not, Muslims, whether you are American Muslims, Sunni Muslims, and Sarullah, 5% followers of Elijah Muhammad, we must forge a unity. We can no longer allow ourselves to stand back and not dialogue with each other and let misunderstanding be fed by our enemies that Muslim will fight Muslim because Muslims are light 
to the whole world that is in darkness and we must never let the enemy put our light out this is our commission Christians stop talking about you a Baptist a Methodist Episcopalian Church of God in Christ holiness God is one Christ is one Allah is one I have said on several occasions that the man Elijah Muhammad that we have misunderstood the whole world is looking for that Messiah both the Muslims the Jews and the Christians are looking for the return of Jesus the Muslims are looking for the return of Jesus the Muslims said Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is but one man coming back and at the end of the world in the time of judgment and resurrection the Muslims will see Jesus return the Messiah the Muslim world is looking for the Mahdi so are the Jews so are the Christians where is this Messiah coming from believe it or not he's not a Caucasian the Jesus of your Bible had hair like lamb's wool he had feet like brass burning an oven and he was the first man begotten of the dead and he rose up from among a dead nation of people you are the dead and Hoover knew you would produce the Messiah I'm saying that the man Farad Muhammad you need to study him closely and the man Elijah Muhammad for in those two you have the two names Messiah or Masi and Mahdi you don't need another reformer because since Prophet Muhammad a reformer has come every hundred years and the reformers have failed to reform the Islamic world the Islamic world needs to be guided to the right path and the only one that's able to do that is the Mahdi who was prophesied to come and that hidden Imam that the world says is that Jesus and I'm saying to you that the secret of your Bible is and Quran is locked up around that man Jesus whom they thought they killed but he was not killed say he lived through a plot to kill him I'm saying this didn't happen 2,000 years ago it happened today the man I'm speaking of Elijah Muhammad this is the resurrection this is the judgment this is the time the Messiah has arrived how do you know he's arrived study his witness I am a witness of him as Aaron was to Moses as Paul was to Jesus as Ali was to Muhammad I am to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad I am a witness that the Messiah is in the world how do you know it your Quran tells you he determines the form of a bird out of clay he opens the eyes of the blind makes the deaf hear the dumb speak and by the permission of Allah he raises the dead to life and he teaches them what foods they should eat and what they should store in their homes the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did that work and is gone from among us but not dead gone from among us I repeat but not dead I am the witness that he lives in his name I come and in his name I have determined by the grace of God the form of a bird out of clay bird only means that you are fashioned in a way where you can float above the wisdom of the world so they became a bird by Allah's permission he breathed into it now we the black people of America mounting up on the wings of knowledge are flying up above the world your eyes are coming open your ears are coming open a dead nation is being raised to life you are being taught what foods to eat and what food to store in your home and a little baby in the cradle is talking wisdom to the ends of the earth and I say to you in truth that the man that the whole world is looking for is the man that God raised up 
among the black people in America. You are the people. This is your time. This is your day. Black man and woman, rise up and be yourself. And so I leave you now saying to you, love one another. Love yourself. Do good to all. And remember that there is power for the black man at last and forever. May Allah bless you as I greet you in peace.